welcome. Thank you for joining us today and worshiping with us uh, online as we gather together here, wherever you are and in this place today. If you do have a worship space at your house or someplace where you continue to watch this online worship service, one thing we suggest to do is you can put out the color of green for the season we're in or and light a candle to represent the Holy Spirit who is here and with us during this time. I'd like to open up with a, a piece of scripture. It comes from the book of Isaiah, the prophet there, and it's simply ver- chapter 62 and verse 2. You'll be called by a new name, which the Lord's own mouth will determine. Let's remember that as we go into our worship today, and we'll kick it over to Pastor Kelly for a few announcements. Thanks, Jim. It's great to be able to come at, uh, come at you from inside the sanctuary this morning. Um, we just have a couple announcements. Um, We're going to be having a communion and prayer service on August 5th at 7 p.m. We just ask that you um, bring your own mask and bring your own chair. It's going to be outside kind of like we did last time, and it's going to be a great time of prayer and reflection and being able to share communion with one another. Um, We also are going to be starting a new Bible study that's called Alter Ego, And um, it's going to be following our sermon series, which is going to be starting today. Um, The Bible study is going to start tomorrow. It's going to be on Mondays. So it begins um, Monday, August 3rd at 630 on Zoom, and I'll be leading those sessions. There's going to be five sessions, um, which is perfect because there's five Mondays in August. Um, So we look forward to being able to study deeper about that with you. And we also have some exciting news. We have uh, now have an Instagram handle, Milford Hills UMC. So um, if you're on Instagram, please be sure and follow us on there. And at Milford Hills United Methodist Church, we have a mission to carry out God's will in the world. And our mission is to love, serve, and live as Christ. And that begins in worship. So let's go to God in prayer this morning. Lord, today we lay down all the things that the world labels us as, and we take up a new name in your son, Christ Jesus. Our identity in you is the one that matters. And Lord, we ask that you help us to cultivate that more and more. Help us to become the ones that you say that we are. Amen. Oh 
a prayer in our service today. And this week we continue to remember Doug Jones, Noel Burns, Steve Surratt, June Scott, and Carol West. Let's go to God in prayer. Oh God, how do we say thank you for your many blessings in our lives? How do we say thank you for you, for you showing us who we truly are? How do we say thank you for sending us Jesus to be our Lord and Savior and your Holy Spirit to be our guide and comforter? We say thank you by whispering a prayer to you in the middle of the day. We say thank you by singing a hymn during worship. We say thank you when we offer encouragement to someone who is feeling lonely. We say thank you when we place a gift in the offering plate. We say thank you when we make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of our community and world and by loving and serving and living as your son did. These are ways that we say thank you, O oh God, for your many blessings in our lives. Gracious and generous God, we pray for those who are in particular need of you this day, those who are grieving the loss of a loved one, those who are ill and concerned about their health, those who are struggling with addiction, those who are anxious about the future, those who are unsure about their job situations, those who are feeling separated from you or from others that they may love. In these moments of silence, we lift up to you, others who are on our minds and hearts today. We pray that you would surround them with your gracious presence and love. Gracious God, we often feel that we don't have that much to offer because we're overwhelmed at just how much that you have given us and continue to give us. And so we thank you for accepting our spontaneous whispers of praise, our presence in worship, our weekly offerings, and our gifts of time through service. We pray all of this in the name of Christ who gave his all and who taught us to pray saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Are we ready for a story? I know I am. Once upon a time, a long, long time ago, there was a tiny, tiny little cat named Itty Bitty Kitty Witty. Oh, that was fun, said Spot. I really like it when we all have lunch together. Me too, said Z. We never got to be with anyone but our own kind at the circus. I think it's so neat that we all get along so well when we're all so different. Exactly, said Frickin' Frack. The farm where we grew up called us silly geese, so other animals didn't want to hang out with us at all. I know what you mean, said Midas. At the zoo, I was called the king of the jungle, the fiercest of all animals. Nobody wanted to be with me. That's what's so wonderful about being here at Milford Hills and learning about God and Jesus, said Itty Bitty. That's right, said Church Mouse. Here we're all called the same name, child of God. And we all have the same job, to love God and to love our neighbors. Of course, said Itty Bitty. 
We might do our jobs a little differently from each other, but we are still doing what Jesus and God have for us to do. Isn't that amazing and wonderful? Mm-hmm, yeah, ooh, it sure is, said the gang. So everyone settled down and snuggled together and made their best happy sounds. The end. Let's say a prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for taking all of us who are so different and bringing us together to be the same in your love. In your name we pray. Amen. We now come to a time of worship where we praise God through the giving of our tithes and our offerings and our gifts. And we just want to thank you for your continuous um, generous giving to our congregation. It enables us to continue to do ministry during this very strange uh, time of social distancing. So you can participate in offering through several ways. Um, you can definitely still um, mail a check to our office. You can also drop off a check in our secure mailbox. You can continue to give through your bank. You can give through our website. You can also give through the Tidely app. Just be sure to you check the little box that says you'll accept the small fee. That way we'll be able to receive 100% of your donation. So let us now thank God through the giving of all of our tithes and gifts and offerings.
Let us now pray and dedicate these gifts to God. Let's pray. Gracious God, we bring our gifts to your altar, asking you to dedicate them to do the work of love and compassion in the world. We learn from Jesus, who had compassion on the crowds who gathered to hear him teach, that putting what we have in the hands of Jesus can bring abundance. Multiply all of these gifts with the love in which they are offered, that they might bring hope to those in need and might glorify and celebrate your love for all of your children. In Christ's name we pray, amen. A word of God today comes from the book of Colossians. It is chapter three in that letter from Paul to the Colossians, and we'll be reading verses one through three. So hear now the word of God. Therefore, if you were raised with Christ, look for things that are above where Christ is sitting at God's right side. Think about the things above and not things on earth. You died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, open my lips and speak through them. Open our hearts so that we can hear your word today. Open our souls so they can be set on fire with love for you. Amen. Verse 2 of the Colossians text says, Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. There's no harder place to do that than in middle school. On Thursday, we'll officially have two middle schoolers in the parsonage. And as they start, as Dean started earlier and as Campbell starts now, we have told them the same thing. Middle school is hard, but no, you're going to get through it. I went through it, and I went through some old pictures, and I found my 13-year-old mugshot. I was the same age as my son is now, going into the same grade, and it's hard for me to look at because it was 1990, 30 years ago. Pastor Kelly was one years old, and the other staff members, Dustin and Blake, they were going to be born that year when it was taken. I want to challenge you to go find your middle school self this week. If you want to post your picture on Instagram or Facebook, do so and, and tag it with hashtag I survived middle school and hashtag alter ego. I hope this will give those parents and those in middle school teachers and administrators and everybody, those who are in uh, middle schoolers themselves, some hope that this is simply just a time in life and they can get past it. So here's my picture, which I will post later on today for the world to see. Yes, it was 1990. I was rocking that cardigan sweater and a turtleneck and a gold chain and that classic teenage bling on my teeth. Back then, I only had one chin, and I was taller than 80% of my friends. I look a lot like my son looks now, lanky and in the middle of puberty. Would I want to go back to this 13-year-old self again? Not one single bit, because I, I survived middle school, and I never want to look back. And middle school is rough because... The students are constantly pumping hormones through their veins, and they are trying to figure out who they are. Drama is high. Feelings get extremely hurt easily. I remember I got a nickname while I was at Ranson Middle School. They called me Football Head. I was a walking caricature back then, a, a human lollipop. I had a stick for a body and from the neck down, and then this huge head on top. I had not grown into my head yet. 
And then as I look at this picture again, I, I can see how my head does. It looks like a football. And if you're chuckling at my expense, it's okay. I have come to grips with this reality and I've moved on, so no worries. But I'm sure many of you could go back to middle school and remember what people called you. You can remember being made fun of because something happened that was embarrassing. I can't imagine how bad things are with students these days. When something happens, there's usually a great chance that someone has recorded it on their phone. And now they can, that moment can live on forever. It can be shared with the whole rest of the world. I mean, because do you remember that kid in middle school who cried during gym class and no one let him forget it? Or that girl who was trying to express herself through her clothes and then took it a little bit too far one day? Or the boy who attempted to go out on a limb and ask the prettiest girl out in front of the whole lunchroom only to get turned down in front of everyone in a very loud and dramatic way? Middle school, it, it can leave scars. The names we are called by our so-called friends can burn themselves into our soul. They can lift us up to, they can make us feel important like the girl who was most popular or the boy who was a star athlete. Those names, can, there are some names in middle school that can also keep you down, that you never outgrew like being the poor kid, the awkward nerdy kid, the, the smart kid with no friends or the shy, quiet loner. I remember a friend of mine who was who desperately wanted a pair of new sneakers that just came out, a pair of Nike Airs. His parents couldn't afford them, or, which I completely understand now that I have two, they didn't want to spend the money on shoes for a kid who was going to outgrow them in four months. He really wanted that pair of Nike Airs, though. And so one day during class, he took a pen and he drew the word Air under the Nike logo. They're white shoes. And it was a black pen and there was no going back. For the next few months, he walked through the halls with fake Nike Airs on and everyone ribbed him for it. But here's the good news. Middle school ends eventually. I finally grew into my head and the nickname football head faded away. I I'm sure you grew past the nicknames you had, but maybe some of you didn't. Maybe you were called stupid in middle school because as you had bad grades and you just can never see yourself as smart. Maybe you were a kid who was always looking for a fight to, to start drama. And maybe in order to hide from some of the pain that you're going through, you, you cause pain in, others people, in other people's lives. And that's the only way that you can find happiness now, as, even as an adult. Maybe you still are Snotty Scotty or Caddy Carol, Big Brenda or Dorky Dan. Sometimes those labels have been given, they've never gone away. So let's play a little game right now because I know we know some people with made up names because they have the as their middle name. I know you remember them. And I'll, so I'll give you the first name and the the in their name and see if you know the rest. Ready? Attila the Hun. Conan the Barbarian. Billy the Kid. Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Winnie the I mean, without knowing these people or characters, you knew what they did or what they were known for. We knew Buffy was a vampire slayer. Conan was a barbarian. We know Billy probably looked like a kid and that Attila, he was a hun. I still don't know why Winnie is a poo, but, you know, four out of five ain't bad. But those names and those labels do not always come from other people. We give them to ourselves. We give ourselves labels all the time. We stare at ourselves in the mirror and we're able, and we look at that person that's looking back at us and we call ourselves ugly because of our nose, our chins, our hair. We know exactly what we have done. And so we look at that person and we can see failure. We can see a person who doesn't try very hard or someone who is afraid to really commit. And those labels that greet us every time we look in the mirror, they burn deep into our ego, our inner self. They turn into who we think we are. We walk around and define ourselves as an addict, someone who she seeks shallow relationships and one night stands or defines ourselves by our browser history. We are 
our worst moments in life, our deepest temptations, and our worst failures. We cannot escape these labels at all, and they bind us down, hold us down, and keep us submissive to them. I like how Greg Cashel puts it in his book. He says, God's power is bigger than your past, and his power is rooted in his love for you. He knows you really are no matter what you are, what others label you or what you label yourself. When we start to grow in our relationship with God, we realize whose we are. We are no longer the world's. We are God's children. We are loved by a God who sent his son into this world to save us all and give us the gift of salvation. This is a transformative and should be alter your life. The hardest thing to do, though, is to listen to who God says you are compared to what the world, others, and what you tell yourself that you are. So here's some really good news. We aren't the first to go to come to grips with this reality. All throughout the stories of the Bible, there are people who believed one thing, but then God transformed them into who God knew they could be. In many cases, they were literally given new names. Early on, First book, Genesis, Abram and Sarai were called by God to birth his people. The world told Sarai that she was too old to have children. She was barren and she believed this herself. So much so that she had Abram, her husband, birth a child with her servant, Hagar. And although they were not perfect, Abram and Sarai, they, they did follow God's call in their lives. And God gave them new names, Abraham and Sarah. Now, Abraham and Sarah's grandsons, Jacob and Esau, they had their ups and downs too together. Jacob swindles Esau out of his birthright and blessing. Later on in Genesis, as Jacob gets ready to meet Esau again, he wrestles with a man, possibly an angel or God himself. And he tells this man that he won't give up until the man blesses him. And in Genesis 32, 28, it says, Then he said, Your name won't be Jacob any longer, but Israel. Because you struggled with God and with men and won. A name change oftentimes meant a transformation in someone's life in the Bible. One of the more familiar moments when God changes someone's name is with a disciple, Simon. In the 16th chapter of Matthew's gospel, Simon tells Jesus that he is the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus replies that Simon is correct. He replies, Happy are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because no human has shown this to you. Rather, my Father who is in heaven has shown you. I tell you that you are Peter, and I will build my church on this rock. We know that Simon, a.k.a. Peter, doesn't have the best track record when it comes to his discipleship. He has lots of moments when he opens his mouth and just inserts his sandal. He tells Jesus at the Last Supper that he's never going to leave his side. But then, later on that evening, denies denies knowing Jesus three times. However, after Jesus' resurrection and with the help of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, Peter turns into this ideal apostle and helps starts the church. We are here because Peter, the rock, followed through with his new name that he got from God. My new name was very hard for me to swallow at first. I felt called into ministry when I was 16 years old, and I ran from the idea of preaching and leading a local church. I did so because speaking up in class, speaking in front of people are things I hated doing. I was always extremely nervous. I stumbled all over my words like probably I'm doing now, and I felt sick most of the time when I was doing it. I couldn't read very well in front of people and definitely don't ask me to speak off the cuff. I ran from the idea of preaching every week, leading committee meetings and leading the local church because I felt like I did not have the gifts and the graces to do that. I labeled myself as someone who couldn't talk in front of others. It was my, I saw it as my biggest weakness. But this, this is what happens with God. God doesn't see us as weak. God doesn't see the same thing we see ourselves as we look at ourselves in the mirror. God sees us for who God created us to be and wants us to live life into that reality to help bring about the kingdom of God here on earth. God took what I saw as a weakness and over time transformed it. 
And I take no credit for leading worship and preaching because I, I wouldn't choose to be here and do that. When my name changed from Jimmy Parsons to Reverend Jim, Pastor Jim, and the one that still makes me swallow hard, Preacher Parsons, I've learned to give into my new name because it was given to me by God. God has given you a new name as well. God doesn't let what you think is a weakness get in the way either. God sees your potential and wants you to live into that reality. God sees you for what you really are. You are who God says you are, not what the world or yourself says. God sees you and wants you to live into the best you you can be. God knows who you can actually be. And all you need to do is leave all those labels behind and trust in the one who created you. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. When we concentrate on things from above, like Colossians tells us, then what Saul, who was given a new name, Paul, writes becomes true. The old passes away and a new life has begun. So maybe you're stuck or bound up in your old name, which is heavy and burdens you with labels. Maybe you have an idea of what God is renaming you, but you're constantly fighting because that new name is a scary thing to think about. Maybe you feel stuck because that old name, those old labels are all you know. Now is the time to lay all of that on the altar of God, to pick up that burden and lay it down on the altar. With God's grace and love, we are transformed into a new life. So let's go, let's let go of all that and give yourself permission to set your mind on things above and not on earthly things. Let God free you, rename you, transform you, and call you to be the person that God has created you to be. And all God's people said, amen. Let us pray. Lord, we give you thanks that you call each, each of us by name. And no matter what those labels are that we have on ourselves or what the world puts on us, you see us as your creation, your beloved child. So if we need a new name, then rename us. If we need to be transformed, then transform us. If we need your love and grace to work in our souls, then Lord, make it so. May we be open for that transformation and that change. May we be open to the new name that you call us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So now let's hear, hear this benediction. The Lord, the God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who knows who you are, calls us to be exactly who we are created to be. So may it be so. Go in peace. Amen. Please remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel and click the bell for notifications, like our Facebook page, and follow us on Instagram. Whatever all that stuff is, because it's 1990 and we barely even have this thing called the internet. Thanks! <laughs>